first question that we receive quite often is basically a, hey, what's going on sort of a question. So at a high level, what changes have we seen? What's important for tech leaders, tech marketers, and tech product managers to understand evolution of B2B buying? How has that behavior changed over the last year or so? Well, I'm here to tell you that lots have changed. Now, that's a really, really high-level answer, but there are so many different facets that have changed in B2B buying and reasons that we are just not going to go back to the way that things have been done. So this isn't just an example of change is constant, we've got to roll with the punches and so on. So let's talk about the types of changes that are here to stay and are forcing organizations like yours to figure out how to be more efficient, how to drive sustainable growth. So first of all, the nature of buying and the nature of who's buying and how they're buying has changed. This is no longer a situation where IT runs herd over technology purchases. Now, granted, that's been changing for a long time, but our data tells us now that line of business buyers, citizen developers, and others that are not central IT have a much more significant role in technology purchases than they ever had. Now, part of that's being driven by the onslaught of SaaS, or software as a service, but even if you're a hardware company or an IT services company, the demand by the business buyer, the line of business buyers and the non-IT people has increased significantly. Not only have those proportions changed, but the demographics of our buyers have changed. And so we've got millennial buyers, we've got Generation X, Generation Y buyers. And you know what? They don't really want to talk to salespeople, at least not early in your sales cycles or not early in their buying processes. They do their research online. They talk to their peers. They try to learn as much about your products and services as they can before they talk to anyone. In fact, many of them want to experience your products before they speak to anyone. And we'll talk a little bit about that, I think, with some of the other questions that we get. But because of that, how you have to approach them has changed. Additionally, and particularly in the last year or so, given what we always refer to as the macroeconomic conditions at hand, we know that deal cycles are slowing down. We know that deal sizes have changed. So quite often we're in a land and expand sort of a model. We're in a situation where sales cycles or buying processes are extended. And not only are those changed, but there's more and more participation by those in finance. And so your prospective buyers and their controllers or their finance executives want to know the value of what you're offering, why it's better and different than what they already have, and why a technology purchase is going and how it's going to drive the outcomes that their organizations need. So all of these things, and if you throw into it the democratization of technology, the availability of capabilities at the consumer level or at every level, I don't want to be the millionth person to bring up chat GPT, but you know, now that it's taking part in everything and being integrated with everything from writing code to developing Pong games to writing cold emails for sellers, there's technology at hand. And that, as well as those other elements, have forever changed the way that we have to think about our buyers and how they buy. And the one last thing that I'll add in an answer to this is that in spite of the unwillingness for buyers to talk to sellers early in a process, in spite of the litany of research that they do on your products and services, do you know what? There is a huge degree of purchase regret after technology purchases have been made and implementations are attempted or done. And it's a percentage that's above 
60% of all technology purchases. So think about it. You have to find ways to reach your buyers, make sure that they can experience and understand the value of what you offer, and then make sure that they're successful once they purchase and implement. So that's a pretty wide variety of change that we've talked about. Now, another question, kind of like a, a follow-up question here is, well, what do we expect is going to happen over the next year or so based on those trends that I was talking about? Well, I'm going to try to net out an answer very simply, and it's that the smart technology organizations out there, when they understand all of these impediments and issues associated with technology buying, are going to try to figure out how to reduce and remove friction from the buying equation. Removing friction in a lot of different shapes and forms and ways is what every provider needs to be thinking about and needs to be strategically and tactically approaching so that they can find their buyers, they can demonstrate and provide an experience to their users. They can articulate value, so on and so forth. So what does that mean in terms of tangible things? And remember that we're gonna talk about all of these things in a lot more depth at TGI in June. But one example is buyer enablement. So the types of information that technology providers need to offer their prospective buyers, their prospective users, and the speed and the timing with which they have to offer it as part of the buying process is crucial. In addition, it's not just buyer enablement, it's user enablement. So one of the topics that's near and dear to my heart is product-led growth. And there's been an explosion of interest in product-led growth over the last one to two years. And we expect that to continue. But one of the things that our tech provider friends are going to have to figure out is how to mesh the user side and the user focus in product-led growth. So the ability for users of a product to experience its value and its capability, mesh that with the ability of the buyers of those products, which remember are not always the same as the users, allow the buyers of those products and services to understand their value, the outcomes they're going to drive, why they're different and better, and economically, how they're going to be an advantage to them. So making those two worlds meet is where we think uh, tech providers need to spend their time as much as they have to figure out how each of those elements, the user enablement and product-led, and the buyer enablement and top-down sales-oriented work and value articulation, you have to figure out all of it. It's not an either or. Now, at the same time, because of the conditions in the market that I talked about, the nature of deals has changed. And so what that means, means a couple of things. One is providers need to take a look at what they are offering. So the Largely, the days of the ginormous, uh, huge enterprise license sort of a thing right out of the gate is going to be really rare. It's going to be much more of a land and expand environment. But that means that you have to think about your packaging, your pricing, how you introduce those things and how quickly you introduce those things to your users and your buyers. And you have to be a lot more precise about who those buyers are. And it's going to mean going back and looking at your ideal customer profiles, your buyer personas, your user personas, the use cases that support all of those things, and making sure that you've got all of that right so that you can be precise and so that you can be efficient at scale. Those are incredibly important components of all of this. Let's go to a third question. And again, I, I encourage folks to write into the chat and ask questions and, and participate. But here's another one. And it's uh, a question that, that we receive pretty often is, what is the most common misunderstanding that we see or hear from product or IT services leaders 
when it comes to trying to drive revenue growth in high tech. And what I would say is uh, there, there are things that are that are uh, misunderstandings and there are things that are just mistakes that are made. And so one of them is playing the blame game. So I, I'm sure that we've all experienced sales pointing a finger at marketing and marketing pointing the finger at sales and so on and so forth. And then uh, pointing the finger at product. Well, you know what, folks, we're all in it together. And when I speak about a go-to-market motion like product-led growth, or even if we think about account-based marketing, these are go-to-market initiatives that require commitment and an all hands on deck. And, and I could make the joke about the, the bacon and egg breakfast and how the pig is committed and the chicken is involved, but you all have to be committed. If you want to do product-led the right way, then your product team, the marketing team, the sales team, the finance team all have to be committed to that motion. Same thing in account-based marketing. It only works when marketing and sales are aligned and they agree and they're going after targets in a unified, well-understood way. That's one thing. I talked a little bit before about the need for a solid ideal customer profile. I can't tell you the number of instances in which we speak and I speak to clients that say, you know, my, my funnel has a lot of garbage in it. People or, or prospects are getting stuck in it. Things aren't flowing the right, well, the right way through it. Well, you know what? One of the leading reasons is because many organizations don't have and haven't taken a precise enough measure and look at who their ideal customers are. And because it's going to be so hard to reach the buyers now and going forward, you have to, you must be precise. You have to have a reliable ideal customer profile. And from that, understand the primary value scenarios or use cases. Understand who the buyer personas are within that. Understand how much influence the users of the products are going to have over those purchases and make all of that fit together. The last misunderstanding that I'll talk about is one, again, close to my heart. In the product-led growth world, probably the, the main misunderstanding or misgiving is that product-led means free software. I talk to IT services companies. I talk to hardware companies who are, quote unquote, being product-led. Now, you can ask yourself, how does a compute or a storage company or a business unit, how can they be PLG? How can an IT services company be PLG? Well, let's go back and think about the root of the, of the meaning. And at its soul, PLG is about reducing and removing friction. And if you think about it that way, it doesn't matter what sort of product or service you have, you've got to make it incredibly easy for your buyers to understand that you get them, you know what their challenges are, you know how quickly they want to get to the point of buying something, and you provide them the education, the guidance, the pricing, the other information so that they can get there as easily and with as little friction as possible. So those are, are some of the misunderstandings. Uh, again, I'll, I'll encourage folks to keep putting stuff in the chat. Let's go to another question. Our next question is, what are some of the greatest challenges that leaders in product marketing specifically, we'll talk about uh, other areas, but what challenges do product marketers face and what approaches have been most effective? I think the friction reduction is a big one. I think I've beaten that one a little bit to death, but in addition to that, it's often hard for product marketers and for technology companies in general to differentiate effectively. Now, our, our data tells us that companies are, are better at this, but if you're an IT services organization and you've got to figure out you know, what you do better than this other services organization, you, know, you don't have features and functions of products typically to hang your hat on. So making sure that you look at all of the things that you offer, the capabilities, and whether that is price, whether it's feature, whether it's methodology, 
whether it's people, all of those things could be differentiators, but only the ones that your buyers are willing to pay for are differentiated. And I would encourage you to try a little game uh, and it's called playing the MUD, M-U-D game. And something is a differentiator when it is meaningful, unique, and defensible. And so test out things that you think are differentiated and see if they check all of those three boxes. That's a step number one. Talk a little bit about trying to reach buyers in the funnel and the, the malaise that's hanging over people's heads about how slowly prospects are moving through that funnel. So one of the things that marketers, product marketers, and product leaders together should be considering is how to obviously fix that, but how to get a product experience of some sort into your buyer's hands so that they can see and understand clearly why you're different. They can see the value in what you do. And they can get a feeling for how your offering product, platform, et cetera, works relative to others. Now, that doesn't have to be a free piece of software or a try and buy disk or you know something like that. There's a world of interactive demonstration out there. And I won't go into the technology behind it, but basically, it is a way to provide a near product experience in an interactive way and allow your buyers, your users to get a look at what your products do early in the buying process. So how many of you have get a demo on your website or on your homepage? How many of you have schedule a demo with sales? Don't do that anymore. I encourage you to take a look at interactive demo or demo automation technology as a way to quickly get your users and buyers involved and get them an experience with your product. Let's go on to another question. Keep those questions coming into the chat. Question here is, what gets me most excited about go-to-market strategy or a go-to-market strategy that I've seen or that we have to look forward to? So I'm gonna go first to the world of product-led growth and say that what gets me really excited is when I have a call on which there's a marketer and there's a product leader, and maybe a sales leader all at the same time. There's not enough of those, but it gets me really excited when the right resources are in the virtual room so that we know that there's that level of commitment among them. It gets me excited when there is an appropriate focus on buyer persona. So not everything is product-led, not everything is bottom-up. There are still going to be situations where given a, a certain type of product or a certain audience, you have to go top-down. Well, understanding your buyers is critical to, to success there. And so, like I said before, it starts with an accurate, ideal customer profile. It continues with an understanding of the use cases where your buyers, your prospects and customers are feeling the most pain. And it continues to depicting those buyer personas and their priorities and the way they make decisions and the journeys they take very specifically. And when people get that right, it's really exciting. One more thing that gets me jazzed and, and unfortunately, I don't see enough of it is when our tech provider clients and, and friends make it easy and, and articulate value appropriately on the way to trying to get a deal done. But not only that, there's articulating value and offering things like value assessment and ROI calculation early in a deal, but following that up and helping your buyers and your ultimately your customers with value realization is critical. In fact, buyers tell us they prefer vendors that do both of those things. So what gets me excited is when I see a company that says, you know what, Mr. Ms. Uh, 
buyer or prospect, we are going to help you understand the value you're going to get and the outcomes that you're going to drive. And we're going to attach metrics to those so that you know what to expect. And you know what? After the purchase, after the implementation, we're going to help you figure out if you got the value that you expected. That's really cool stuff. And by the way, it links to a huge focus that we know that our, our clients need to have on customer marketing and upsell, cross-sell, and expansion with an existing customer account. So when we see that happen, that's pretty good stuff. Okay. We have explored five, I think, really interesting questions. And unfortunately, I think that we are at time for today. But I hope that this has given you a little bit of insight into different elements of and methods that will help drive efficient and sustainable growth. We've talked about precision. We've talked about optimization. We've talked a little bit about techniques that help try to grease the skids a bit and reduce friction for your buyer. So all of that should drive efficiency both for you and for them. And remember, if you want to get the entire story and you want us to help you put those pieces together and you want to try to exchange those ideas with your peers, I encourage you to sign up for and attend TGI June 14th and 15th in San Diego, California. We think it's gonna be a great event. I'd encourage you to feel free to continue the conversation in the comments and the good folks at Gartner Live will be back again soon. Thanks very much and have a great rest of your week.